asked me whether I would call. Oh, I, I, I think he is a war criminal. It's the sharpest condemnation yet of President Putin and Russian actions by U.S. officials since the invasion of Ukraine. While other world leaders have used the words, the White House had been hesitant to declare Putin's actions those of a war criminal, saying it was a legal term that required research. Russia has called the labeling unforgivable rhetoric. Our president is a very wise visionary and cultured international figure and the head of the Russian Federation, the head of state. So such statements by President Biden are absolutely unacceptable, improper, unforgivable. And what's more important, I believe, such comments cannot be made by a head of state that has been bombing people around the world for years, has dropped a nuclear bomb on a country that had already been defeated, so there was no reason to do it. I mean, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and so on and so forth. A president of such a country has no right to say such words at all. Putin ordered a large-scale invasion of Ukraine three weeks ago, saying Russia wants to force the disarmament of Ukraine's military and topple the pro-Western government. Ukraine's military, backed by a heavy flow of Western weapons, has fought back, largely stalling the Russian advance. Russian troops have turned increasingly to bombardments of civilians, prompting three million Ukrainians to become refugees. In Moscow, President Vladimir Putin delivered a stark warning to so-called Russian traitors, who he says the West wants to use as a fifth column to destroy the country. Russian experts fear the message could lead to a new round of repression against those who don't agree with the government. All right, to talk a little bit more about this, we're joined by Professor John Stremla from the Department of International Relations, School of Social Sciences at Wits University. Uh, a very good evening to you, Prof, and thank you so much for speaking to us at this hour. I realize uh, you may have uh, energy challenges, but hopefully the lights will stay on. But share some lights on this, Professor Stremla. The Kremlin blasting the U.S. president for his use of the term war criminal in reference to uh, President Vladimir Putin of Russia. Uh, can we just start with the understanding, technical otherwise, of what is meant when somebody is called a war criminal? Well, the world court just recently, uh, yesterday, uh, rendered a judgment against Russia 13 to 2 that said that they must cease this invasion immediately. And of course, uh, the ruling is binding, but I expect that Putin will ignore it as he has ignored other binding agreements, such as the UN Charter on Territorial Integrity and Sovereign Equality, or more importantly and immediately, when the um, Ukrainians became independent, a sovereign state in, uh, in 30 years ago, the same time South Africa did, after the fall of the Berlin Wall and they had a plebiscite and they agreed to go independent, they had a lot of nuclear weapons. And in order to get those nuclear weapons out of uh, Ukraine, Russia and Germany and a couple of other powers, I think the United States, all agreed to an arrangement for denuclearization, just as was happened in South Africa uh, with, with the nuclear weapons that were here under the apartheid regime, to get rid of these nuclear weapons. And uh, in return, uh, Russia signed a treaty that it would never ever invade or otherwise uh, violate the sovereignty of the independent state of Ukraine. Now, in on September 24th, uh, Putin broke uh, that again and, and invaded, of course, as we all know. But he was probably um, uh, underestimating the Western resolve in light of the fact that when he annexed Crimea back in 2014 or fomented the unrest in the eastern provinces of Ukraine, there was no real it's response from the West. This time, the West was very united. He was wrong about that. This time, the Russian economic self-sufficiency that he thought he had secured proved to be quite hollow because the sanctions are biting and he's now uh, apparently going to forfeit his debt, uh, or at least that's what they were saying in, this, in the press today. 
Uh, the quality of the Russian army was great, grossly un, uh, overestimated, and that's me. I, I thought the Russian army would sweep right into uh, Ukraine because we all underestimated the resistance and the nationalism of the Ukrainian people. And I know there'll be a lot of talk about, well, they're getting a lot of assistance from the U.S., but there's no troops. There are no, and, and Biden has been very clear about this. There, there was an unwillingness to impose a, a, a no-fly zone or to provide the transfer of MiGs uh, from, uh, from Poland in response to the U.S. replacing those planes. Uh, I think the U.S. has been very careful about not escalating this thing, but Putin makes a lot of noise. Okay, so I do ask, and I'd, I'd like you to go back to the definition of what a war criminal is as per Article 147 of the Fourth Geneva Convention, or even if it's the legal understanding of the statute. And the reason I ask that is it's important to understand if there's going to be a policy follow-up of what the U.S. State Department, we, we've just said in that report by my colleague, has said that he was speaking from the heart. But it's one thing speaking from the heart, and it's another turning that into a policy directive. No, this, but but you misunderstand what what a policy is all about. There is no enforcement mechanism. The the court, for example, the World Court, that has uh, ordered a, a cessation of the invasion and a reversal, getting the the troops out of Ukraine, uh, on the basis of the merits of the case presented to the World Court, um, it is not enforceable. Um, it, 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 the the Russians are supposed to be obligated by it, but it's not enforceable. Um, and, and what a war criminal, uh, it, for me, is the um, shelling of the theater in, in Marpol uh, yesterday that, that uh, was sheltering 600 people, mostly children, and several hundred were apparently killed in the process of that destruction of that uh, uh, landmark uh, a theater. Uh, I've seen the photographs uh, of, of the young family that were fleeing through a humanitarian corridor that were gunned down um, uh, allegedly by the, the Russians. And the they Washington Post checked into it and they found, yes, indeed. We know that the shelling is occurring. The, the kind of film that, um, that Zelensky showed the joint session of Congress yesterday, which I watched, um, I've seen by, by BBC and, 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 and rep, rep, reputable news organizations, the New York Times, the Washington Post, since sep February 24th. Um, I, I, I really think that, that um, uh, Putin misjudged completely how easy and how welcome the invasion would be. Okay. But don't forget the Ukrainians have been fighting fighting the, uh, the, the Russians since, since 2014. So, Professor Stremla, it's not my willful misunderstanding of what a war criminal is. I say this against the backdrop of the State Department saying that it's looking at initiating a process officially designating Putin a war criminal. So I want to understand in practical terms what does it mean. If, uh, for instance, the law uh, of war is a component of international law, how would you then manifest that understanding from a public policy point of view. Um, <laughs> but you under, don't understand, the, these laws are not enforceable. The State Department will, no doubt, render a judgment. And uh, uh, what, what, what we're seeing constantly are judgments being rendered by the UN General Assembly because the Security Council was paralyzed because of the Russian veto. Um, and, and, and so it goes. Um, but in the case of, of, of a war crime, um, the, the, uh, the possibility of bringing uh, someone to the International Criminal Court is very limited. And in the case of Russia, I don't think that there is any doubt that uh, these, these crimes will not be prosecuted unless he is sent before at some point after he leaves power, but don't forget he's changed the constitution so he's gonna be in power in 2036. Uh, and he's clamped down on all opposition within the, the in, in Russia. If, if he is deposed, he, he could face something like a Nuremberg trial. But I think this obscures the fact that there is broader issues here about the um, humiliation that the Russians felt when they lost the Cold War and that Putin has responded to, but in a very militaristic, colonial, neo-colonial way, and he's trying to recolonize 
the independent sovereign state of 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 uh, Ukraine. And I, I don't think you want to waste a lot of time by trying to pick legal arguments in a in a very political very much a military situation mm. that is going to be settled on the battlefield not i, I don't in, think in, in professor Str of law. professor Stremler, i think us seeking to understand the ramifications of the political elements of this uh, military operation is important especially if there is an international uh, court of justice that handed down a verdict we know that there is a separate uh, appeal to the International Criminal Court. The United Nations itself has asked that there be an investigation. So it's really just trying to piece together what you know all of this will amount to. And also I think it's important also for our viewers to understand um, what governs uh, the conditions for initiating war, the conduct of warring parties. We know that both parties are contradicting each other on said war military operation. This is a political military conflict. I am not a lawyer. I am sure that you could consult an international lawyer and he could give you the fine print. I mm. think from my perspective as an international relations specialist that it is it is it is meaningless. Okay. I think the United Nations has proven to be impotent by virtue of the veto that the Security Council rendered. The Security Council is the only organ of the United Nations which has any enforcement power. And the Russian uh, ambassador vetoed uh, a, a resolution to condemn this uh, uh, in, in, in invasion. And, and that is the fact. So it's going to be settled on the battlefield. Okay, so uh, what about the diplomacy aspect of it? What would then that achieve? What chances does it have to achieve? Especially if we're speaking about um, this has been a, a lot under the radar today. The uh, Mariupol bombing of a theater, which it's been said that 500 civilians have been uh, impacted on the obviously the resultant destruction of infrastructure cutting off telecommunications power water heating which uh, observers have said in itself is a violation of human rights so how does that impact the diplomacy aspect of this the diplomacy aspect of this will only be important if and when Putin decides that he has no possibility of winning. I think that is a possible scenario, and I'm very supportive of Cyril Ramaphosa taking a sort of back of the back of position of, of not wanting to criticize either side for the purposes of perhaps positioning South Africa, which could be, which is a friend of China and would need Chinese support, which is a friend of the United States and would need American support, which is a friend of, and would need European support. But it is not on its own in a position to do anything until the situation on the ground becomes ripe enough and Putin concludes that he cannot win. And I don't think we're there yet. So it is, in a, in a, in a way, the diplomacy can only work when one of the, of the of, and, and, and Zelensky can't win, but he can not lose. And if he does not lose, if he can continue this this war, I think that the, the, the crumbling of the morale of the, of the Russian troops, the inability to resupply them, a whole variety of issues which you all go into, um, will, will, will force Putin's hand and then you could have diplomacy and you could have a, rec rec a negotiated solution and a formula that would allow for um, peace to be restored uh, in a very badly damaged and don't forget there are four, over four million refugees, mostly women and children, uh, out of the country and a lot of uh, internally displaced. So the rebuilding of, of Ukraine is a horrific challenge if it ever comes to that. All right. Professor, thank you for your time and insights. As always, Professor John Stremler, he is from the Department of International Relations, School of Social Sciences at Wits University.